Dylan? What? What? What are you doing here? What are you doing at my house? I have no money. I'm a sad, lonely man. Rather than wait for the sweet embrace of death to come naturally, I see no other recourse than to come here and commit seppuku. But first, I'd like to share my love of the movie Harakiri. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Come, come right on in. I love that movie. Yeah, I'll, I'll make us some tea. Hello YouTube, this is Adam Royce of AN Productions, and joining me is the one and only SuperDM64, a.k.a. Dylan McCann. Let's say hi, Dylan. Always a pleasure to be on this channel. The few times that you have been, other than with Daimajin. Okay, so without Daimajin, there was that episode of Creature Feature, and I think that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> but if you count Daimajin, I've been here four times. Right, 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 right. But, um... So, why are we here, Dylan? Please explain to the audience why we're, we're here today. Mm. Recently, I have been um, further uh, exploring a, an area of my film education that was um, not completely uh, devoid of any knowledge, but, but less developed than, say, my kaiju knowledge, for example. Uh, Japanese samurai cinema. Um, this began with me watching a few uh, Kurosawa films. And uh, then on uh, Sean Barry. Wait, 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 wait. Which which um, samurai films by Akira Kurosawa did you watch? I saw Throne of Blood and Yojimbo. Two excellent, excellent picks. No, not Hidden Fortress yet. No, not yet. Oh, that's a, a beautiful film. <laughs> I will also be watching Rashomon and uh, Sanjuro because TCM, a channel that I love, will be airing those on June the seventh. Oh, really? Okay, cool. I'll stay tuned for those. Yeah, that's uh, actually where I saw the last two. I recorded them off of there. Uh, anyway, uh, so knowing that I was waiting for June the 7th to see my next two Kurosawa films, Sean Berry gave me something that he recommended for me to watch in the interim, uh, a film by Masaki Kobayashi, who is uh, Adam's favorite Japanese film director. Yes, hands down. You know, as much as I gush over Shiro Honda and Kurosawa, Masaki Kobayashi is my favorite director to come from Japan, as well as one of my favorite directors of all time. He's in the top three. And the film that Sean Barry uh, recommended for me and gave me a link to, because uh, at, at the moment it is available on YouTube. Which is awesome. Uh, is the, what is it, 1962? 1962. 1962 film Harakiri, which is, of course, a Japanese word meaning a ritual form of suicide, also known as seppuku. Uh, uh, immediately a, a beautiful title that just screams cheerfulness. Oh yes, this is clearly a fun romp for the whole family. <laughs> uh, and I saw this movie a while ago. I've been a huge fan of Masaki Kobayashi for a very long time. His first movie I ever watched was Kwai Dan, uh, made in 1964, and is his only color film, uh, or his m only major color film, and his only Toho film as well. And that introduced me to Mizaki Kobayashi, and then I started researching him because I like this movie so much. And then I watched Samurai Rebellion, Harakiri, and his three-part epic, The Human Condition, which blows my mind to this day. But my favorite one, it remains to be Samurai Rebellion. Hopefully we'll, we'll cover that one day. But Mizaki Kobayashi is definitely a master of his craft. 
I, I can't say enough about this director. Uh, some people worship Yoshijiro Ozu, which I can't stand the man. Uh, <laughs> some people do Nikiru Nuruse uh, or, or Akira Kurosawa. I say the greatest director to come from Japan is Mizaki Kobayashi. His films, to me, is art. Like, I, I never can look away from the screen. He composes his shots beautifully. It's almost like every shot is like a painting. Mm -hmm. And you just can't help but just stare at it. Even if it's the most stillest of thing, you can't help... Two people sitting in a room, you can't help but stare at the screen, how it's lit, uh, how it's set up, everything. It's just absolutely beautiful. He is definitely a master of his craft, very stickler for cinematography. I haven't seen any of his earlier works. I've only seen his main films, which is, of course, the, the ones that I've just mentioned earlier. I want to get that wonderful list from uh, the Criterion Collection just released under the Eclipse series, which has, I believe, four of his earliest films. He hasn't directed that much, uh, but man, what he directed, he nailed. <laughs> hmm. That was uh, well, everything you just described, uh, very present here. Um... There are some directors that when you first get into their stuff, you're uh, just blown away simply on a, a visual level besides everything else. Uh, to go with an American example, uh, most people have this when they first get into Kubrick. Uh, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's very, very uh, strongly uh, apparent here with Masaki, Kobay uh, Masaki excuse me, Kobayashi um, in Harakiri. Uh, the entire thing, as you said, just captivating, beautiful, could not look away from the screen. Um, and wouldn't want to. Uh. Right, like, yeah, the entire film you don't want to look away. Though this recent viewing of it, I had a hard time watching it, but that that's for completely different reasons. That has no fault, really, with the movie. Um, and and it, it, even with, with all of his films, his use of the dolly mm -hmm. is very, very captivating. If you notice a lot of uh, Akira Kurosawa films, uh, Akira Kurosawa all his films always have like a beginning, middle, and end in all of his shots, and he has a lot of really, really long takes that hardly ever move. The only thing that's moving is the stuff on screen, not so much the camera itself. Mizaki Kobayashi moves the camera. A uh, good example, um, I mentioned before that I had just recently watched Throne of Blood. A um, lot of moments of just the characters sitting and talking, and there's no real camera movement going on, it's just the, the characters themselves. Uh, <laughs> Most notably, the scene where uh, the wife is trying to convince the, the main character. It's a Japanese adaptation of Macbeth, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, the wife is trying to convince the main character to uh, kill the uh, lord above him. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just them talking. The camera doesn't move. They move a little bit. Uh, but like you said with Masaki, uh, Masaki Kobayashi, there are cuts and pans and all that stuff. <laughs> Very much present. I mean, we're making him sound like he cuts a lot, but he really doesn't. A lot of his stuff is done with the trickery of the camera, which I think is a great thing. To me, that's art right there when you use the trickery of the camera. And he uses a lot of, especially in this film, it is very much so prevalent in this film more than his others. He uses a lot of like these close-ups where the camera is slowly zooming in on the, or the, is slowly pushing in on the face. Mm -hmm. Like it's already a close-up, but the camera keeps pushing in. And it adds more dramatic emphasis. And a lot of that comes with the great reveal at the ending of, of Harakiri, uh, where, where you find out <laughs> um, just what uh, Tetsuya Nakadai's character has been hiding from all of those clansmen. <laughs> yes, yes. Fantastic. A wonderful uh, reveal, wonderful character. I loved Tetsuya Nakadai in this film. Yes. Uh, fantastic performance. Uh, now, you've seen Tetsuya Nakadai in Yojimbo, but other than that, that this is really your biggest in, introduction to him as well as an actor? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. He, um, and only, yeah, him starring in a role and giving a really noteworthy performance, yes, this is pretty much the first time. Yeah, a lot of people equivalate um, Toshiro Mafune, who played in Yojimbo, the main lead in Yojimbo, and Throne of Blood, uh as the Japanese Clint Eastwood. However, I don't think he is. I think he was more of a sex symbol than Clint Eastwood ever could have been. I think he's more of the Japanese Charlton Heston. I think Tetsuya Nakadai truly is the Japanese Charlton uh, Japanese Clint Eastwood uh, from all of his roles that he, pl that he plays. Mm. I mean... 
he, he does certainly seem to have a little bit more of an edge to him in this film than uh, uh, Mifune did in the two Kurosawa films that I've watched. Right, right. Um, with, with the exception of maybe Throne of Blood towards the end when he starts to go crazy. And uh, I know we're not talking about this film now, but the way how Tetsuya Nakida and Toshiro Mifune work off of each other in Samurai Rebellion is absolutely glorious, and I can only say it enough that that's my favorite Mizaki Kobayashi film, hands down. Uh, but... Uh, and, and here, Tetsuya Nakadai plays the main character who is a very troubled ex-samurai. Uh, who basically, I, I believe, the clan that he worked for was destroyed. Or became, or grouped in with another one, and a bunch of his friends committed seppuku. And so he's put in charge of this man, his best friend's son. And he marries that son, um, what was his name? Come on, I just had it in my head. Okay, I should open up the uh, wiki page for all the names. I think it's Matome or yeah, Mamoke some, it's or... something. It's something along those lines. But anyways, um, the whole thing is very. The film itself is very strangely uh, executed. It's not shown in chronological order whatsoever. Um, it, no, it's, it's, it's done a lot in flashback. You know, it's interesting watching this movie. I can't help but think that, that Tarantino uh, <laughs> must have drawn some inspiration. I I, um, I was reminded a little bit of, of Kill Bill watching this movie because of the, um, number one, the revenge plot, but also the non-linear linear storytelling, and also the way that the dialogue um, is um, sort of analytical. Uh, I definitely saw time. a lot of influence from Kill Bill in the dialogue scenes between Tetsuya Nakadai's character and the leader of the, uh, I, e, the E, I don't know, the clan, the clan leader there that sits up at the podium, who's always looking down at Tetsuya Nakadai. Uh, there's definitely some influence there. This is a very influential film uh, <laughs> for for a lot of directors. Uh, and it's an absolutely masterful film. I can't say that enough. Um, uh, I don't. I think that the, um, since we were talking a little bit about Nakadai and his performance, also the, um, the, the villain, uh, whatever his name was, um, gave an equally, uh, well, maybe not equally, also gave a fantastic performance, and he was able to play off of Nakadai very well. The, the dialogue between the two of them, which pretty much constitutes a good 60 to 70 percent of the movie, uh, is, is very engaging. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's easily, like... I'd say 75% of the movie takes place in, like, one room. And, and it's in that room where Tetsuya Nakadai is just telling a story to those clansmen, hoping that it would get a point across, which it ultimately doesn't, and what results is an epic showdown to the death. <laughs> Indeed. Um, As one would want from a samurai flick. <laughs> exactly. I mean, who else watches samurai flicks for that? Which is actually part of why this film was made. Uh, Mizaki Kobayashi was very much so a maverick when it came to films. He was a pessimist, like Shiro Honda, except... Uh, and actually, an interesting bit of trivia, the human condition is slightly based on his experiences in World War II, because Mizaki Kobayashi was drafted, and he served in Manchuria, where he fought in a few engagements and wound up being captured by the Russians. And he didn't come back to Japan until late 1946. And... That changed him, uh, and he he's kind of and this is one another reason why I like him, is because he's very much like oh so this is the standard for samurai films well I'm gonna do my own thing just to go against it, he kind of pulled a a Sergio Leone before Sergio Leone was even thinking about doing that, uh, he with Har for example, when he made. Um, God, I'm drawing a blank. I just said his name, too. The Human Condition. When he made The Human Condition, uh, a lot of movies were released in Japan around that time were being made all around the world that were very high-octane uh, high war films that had a lot of action and a lot of dumb characters and stuff like that. So he decided... That, and they were very quickly paced. So he decided to sit back and make a very slow-paced nine-hour epic. That is a very pessimistic tone. With Harakiri, 
a lot of films are being made by by several several directors from Seijun Suzuki to even Akira Kurosawa that took place in feudal Japan and it would always usually take place in the late 1700s through the mid 1800s so Mizaki Kobayashi sat back and said well I'm gonna make mine takes place in the 1600s and I'm gonna have it be an FU to the feudal system because that's exactly what this movie is in a nutshell. Well, the entire movie, movie um, from a thematic standpoint, is a uh, uh, criticism of the Bushido Code. Yes. Essentially. Yeah. Well, while a lot of samurai films around the time and Akira Kurosawa is included on that list praised the Bushido uh, Code, Mizaki Kobayashi was questioning it. Yeah. Um, you can also see him uh, deviating uh, from the norm just in terms of like uh, the violence in this movie um, you watch uh, Yojimbo and it's much more stylized uh, oh yeah definitely way more stylized at the end of the movie Toshiro Mifune pretty much just tears through the bad guys uh, with little to no effort which was kind of a problem for me because I like a final battle to be a bit more um, dynamic than that but anyway he tears through them with ease in this movie the, the violence is brutal and it never stops being brutal either yeah um, yeah and, and that actually gives me uh, it brings up one complaint which i'll get into after i make this point the final battle with tetsuya nakadai and against all those clansmen there's no music whatsoever no and all the sound effects are really there um in fact that was a trade of mizaki kobayashi that he used actual sound effects he didn't do stuff in post uh, that's why in all the gunshots in, in uh, the human condition are, are real. They're not stock sound effects. They were actually recorded on the boom, which I think is awesome, or, or at least interesting to look at from an aesthetic point of view. Anyways, but my complaint was there was this one, the, that one duel with him in the wind, mm -hmm. with him going up against that guy who, who cut off his son-in-law's head during this infamous seppuku scene, uh, which we'll get into a little later. When they duel there, there's no music whatsoever in there, and I honestly had a little bit of a problem with that. <laughs> uh, I felt like there should have been some sort of kato music, or uh, Toru Takamitsu's um, uh, very Japanese score for this film. Uh, I wish there was music there. It looked amazing, but I just wish, I thought the music would add another punch to it. I don't know if you had that feeling or not, Dylan. Uh, I didn't personally, but I can certainly see um, your point. There were a few moments, specifically when he starts doing the uh, that that uh, cross arm movement. That's currently my uh, status picture on Skype. Um, weren't there a few moments there where you had a little bit of a? Uh, oh yeah, you had like a string there, and then you had a, like a strum there and there. Yeah, but there isn't really much accompaniment. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that until now, actually. Yeah, I had I'd never really thought about it until this recent viewing, and that was because I was really tired, I, and I am really tired while recording this, but <laughs> um, I was like, man, I wish there was music here to kind of accompany it, or like some crazy Kato music going on, like I thought that would have added another punch to the scene, mm -hmm. because during the other two parts where he goes on that bit of vendetta against all the people that harmed his, his son-in-law, he's collecting their uh, little bow tie, uh, their little ponytails, uh, yeah. which is an extremely clever thing to do, and it is another middle finger to the Bushido Code. Um, because in the Bushido Code, that meant everything. That yeah. meant you were, you were respected, that meant you were high in rank, that meant it's everything. Your, it's your status symbol. It's, yeah, if you're... Having it cut off is a huge dishonor. Um, right. And, and norm, normally he doesn't... You would... you, you'd expect Tetsuya Nakadai to... I was expecting him to go out and kill them, and then he pulled out their their bow ties, and in essence, he almost did something worse than kill them. He dishonored them. Well, you know, under the uh, strictest uh, interpretation of the Bushido Code, when you are dishonored in such a way, you need to perform harakiri. Uh, so right, right. essentially what he does is uh, put them into the same fate that his uh, uh, son-in-law. Well, they all mocked his son-in-law, um... God damn it, his, that name's going to drive me nuts. It is Matome. They all mocked, all these characters that he cut off their bony tails, mocked M Matome for being very cowardly when performing Harakiri. 
uh, or and even before that. And so when when Tatsuya Nakadai comes in and asks to perform Harakiri, he's about to do it, and he asks for his second person, the person who's supposed to chop off his head, essentially. Um, he asks for those three people, and of course that makes the entire clan suspicious as to what Tatsuya Nakadai is planning. But it's interesting, because if you're dishonored, and according to Bushido, you're supposed to kill yourself, and yet these people are hiding. The people yeah. that were mocking Matome for cowardice are now hiding, because he cut off their... Uh, Tetsuya Nakadai was able to cut off their ponytails. If Motome was truly the coward that they uh, um, uh, mocked him for being... Which he, he wasn't, have... which he wasn't, in all fairness... He wasn't. He wouldn't have been able to go through with horrible uh, circumstances. Oh, suicide. God. Oh, God. Um, I want to save that for a grand finale, because that really is the moment everyone remembers from the movie. <laughs> I... And, you know, there's an in interesting twist involved in it, because when the um, the guy who runs the house when the master's away uh, is telling the story to uh, Nakadai about what happened with Matome, he, um... The, you only see you don't know at that point that Matome and Nakadai knew each other at all because again this is a non-linear uh, movie. Right. You don't know that they were in any way related or knew each other at all, and so it just seems like the story another similar story that they're recounting. And um, when you only see his side of the story as he's telling it, it seems like Matome really was a coward. Um, yeah. A coward. And so you all, <laughs> when you're watching th that, you almost feel as if um, he's not nece not necessarily in the way that they carry it out. You almost feel like the uh, clan is uh, justified in but what they do, you, right? Yeah. But but then as you receive more information, you realize that it's a much more complicated issue. Oh, uh, much more. <laughs> and that and that's really a, a major uh, criticism of the Bushido Code. Here is that it um, has all these strict tenets about what should be done with uh, very little. Uh, thought into uh, ex ex uh, temporaneous circumstances, such as what was going on with Matome, who um, was brought there by a very shitty life. Uh, a very, very, very shitty life. And he had to lie to, 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 to Yanakadai, who was basically his second father, uh, just to prove that it's okay to have two dads. There's my political statement of the day. Uh, ah. <laughs> and... and um, he lies to Tetsuya Nakadai saying that he knows like this merchant or something like that and he's going to try to get a job something like that and instead he's going to go up to this clan and ask hey I need money please if if I don't let me commit Harakiri in the hopes that the clan will say no you're a samurai we might need you and we'll just give you the money and move you on your merry, and your, on your merry way to save his wife and son from dying he does right. this as a last ditch act of desperation because his wife is uh, is very weak and pale I think she's dying of tuberculosis because she coughs off blood they never right. say that in the movie but I think that's what they were implying and in this time period that would be a, that, a, yeah it would make a lot of sense an uncurable sort of thing right uh, and then his son comes down with a raging fever and is basically burning to death which that lends the other part of the story that's on like a lot of them, where like films like Yojimbo and you know Hidden Fortress and all those samurai films, end with some of, with a very happy note. This does not end on a happy note whatsoever. No, this everyone movie is you fucking bleak. like dies. This movie is incredibly bleak. Um, uh, which kind of leads to my slight problem with it. Because this is such a criticism, the criticism of Bushido, there's that the figure or the symbolism of the red, of the red armor, yes, uh, of that clan. Uh, you know, you think it would end. You see, this is another reason why I like Samurai Rebellion. I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but it makes you smile. The ending makes you smile. It makes you feel like you have hope. Here, there, it makes you feel like. There is no hope. The The bad guys are always going to win. Fuck that shit. There, there's no point to anything. Which it, it really comes down to me, not so much criticizing it, but comes down to more of what mood I'm in. And right now I, I feel like I want more of a happy ending. No, the things are going to work out in the end, even though in this film they completely don't. They crash and burn and everyone fucking dies. Yeah. Horrible it's, deaths. It's 
pretty, um, it is a pretty sad ending. I didn't, <laughs> I, I, um, I enjoy, uh, dark movies and, and Oh, me uh, too, don't get me wrong. Bleak, <laughs> bleak endings and all of that, um, goodness, so it, so it isn't a problem, but I can certainly see why it can be uh, a bummer. <laughs> and that's why and that's why I had such a hard time watching in this one. I, I didn't want to watch something bleak and down. I wanted something like Son of Godzilla. <laughs> I wanted yeah, something yeah. very upbeat and very... Something like Yojimbo. Yojimbo is very, very upbeat throughout the entire thing. Uh, yeah, any, when you look at... um, To go back to the, the comparisons with the Throne of Blood, Throne of Blood is a little bit bleaker than Kurosawa's usual affair. It's a bit darker in tone and moody and atmospheric and there's tons of fog and all that shit. But the bad things that happen in that movie happen to people who deserve to have bad things happen to them, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, Toshiro Mifune deserved that arrow to the neck. Uh, <laughs> Which was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> in in this movie, sure, Tetsuya Nakata manages to take a few of them with him. Because uh, all of the people whose top knot he cut off the lord of the manor then orders them to be uh, forced into Harakiri as well, so they're all gonna die. He took out a few of them in that fight at the end, but at the end of the day, there's nothing he can do to sort of, uh, I guess, win in this situation, and he 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 knows that going in. The it the is, thing that would have made me have a little bit of hope would have been if when when he does in his last ditch effort before he is gunned down, he picks up the 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 red armor and throws it down. And then right before the last shot of the movie, you see it getting pinned back up. Meaning that what he did was in vain. The bad guys are still here, and they're going to win. Bushida ultimately wins out. Uh, that there's no hope for the average person. I thought it would have been more fitting as if the armor was destroyed in the process. Yeah. yeah. Be because but, but... the armor ultimately is... I mean, it opens with the armor, and it ends with the armor. It's it's very much so the symbol of Bushido. Yes. And the, uh, of just the entire honor code that they were living under, the entire moral system, it's expressed in the plot that this uh, clan that he's going to visit is known and renowned for their uh, martial valor, as they put it. Um, yeah, and, and, and the villain, the main villain here, well, he's not even really a villain per se, He's just an antagonist for Tetsuya Nakadai. There is no real true villain in this. No, it's... there are some slimy characters. Uh, the the swordsman that he has the fight with isn't particularly likable, but I wouldn't call him a villain. Yeah, he's not a villain. villain. This isn't like Yojimbo where there was a clear fucking villain, which ironically was Tetsuya Nakadai as well. However, <laughs> um, <laughs> here, here, it's all due to circumstances. Uh, yeah. Everything that plays out, which is a very clever thing, and something that Tetsuya Naka, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mizaki Kobayashi plays with a lot in all of his films. Well, the, the the villain of the piece really is is the code. Bushido is the Bushido's the, fought, but Bushido is the force, the antagonistic force that needs to be um, overcome. The armor itself and what it represents is sort of in that way the villain of the piece, because all of the people in that house who are. Um, doing these terrible things are just doing them because of this system that they have been raised with their entire lives. It's no different than a religious extremist right, or anything right, like that. Right, right, uh, right. And, you know, it, it all... That's another thing I kind of like about the movies, how it comes full circle. I'm a fan of parallel editing. And that definitely comes through here with that, with those final shots of the thing, or, or of the film itself. Uh, with Tetsuya Tetsu Nakadai ultimately dying. Uh, but you do get the sense that they're pinning the armor back up and they're sort of um, covering everything up that happened at the house that day. Yes, they, uh, yes. The, yep. the official story that they release is that Tetsuya Nakadai um, committed Harakiri uh, honorably and that a few of their men also happened to die from disease conveniently at the same time. Right. Uh, that's, that's the story that they're circulating, uh, but they know what really happened, you know what I mean? And so, even though the people at large don't know about it, the um, clan itself has been dishonored. And Tetsuya Nakadai knows that going to the grave. And the, the guy, the guy who runs the house, I wish I could remember his name, he knows it. Even if nobody else winds up knowing it, he knows it. And Saito. He, his name is Saito. Saito. And he winds up having to um, betray his own... Thought, uh, belief system. He has to betray his own. Yes, he sense did. Of he basically valor. is now living on a lie. 
which yeah, is he, extremely against the Bushido code. He had to betray his own uh, sense of martial valor in order to um, try to uh, uphold the status of the house, which is more important to him. And this isn't There's long the scene... after the scene where he, where Saito brags about how much they honor the code and how much they abide by these moral standards. Exactly. There's even that shot where when he tells his little henchman guy um, to do all this covering up, the the guy kind of looks at him and says, Sir, like, are we really going to do this? And he calls him a fool and tells him to go on. Like, They know that they've been dishonored at the end of the day. Uh, so there is a small victory in that sense. Uh, it wasn't enough to carry me, unfortunately. Um but that that's very much Masaki Kobayashi's style, though. That very that very much so is. I love how I'm bitching about how in, this ending is very bleak, and then there's the ending from The Human Condition, which is the bleakest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to tell you what it favorite, is. But... And it's your second favorite Kobayashi film. Uh... I know. <laughs> I do call it my second favorite, even though it's three. But <laughs> uh, well, It's kind of like... Kind of like Lord of the Rings, I consider the, the yeah, entire trilogy yeah. one big I consider the piece. Gamma Trilogy, the Lord of the Rings Trilogy, and this trilogy as, like, one big thing. Uh, but anyways, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let, let's talk about the infamous scene that involves oh, yeah. some guy disemboweling himself with a bamboo stick. The titular Arakiri. Um, what were and, your reactions to it when you when you watched it? I'm, I'm curious to know. When trying to um, warn Andres about the violence in Harakiri, when I sent him the link, uh, I told him, uh, I explained to him that the plot revolved around ritual suicide, and I was like, the scene that involves that is, and there is a pun intended, uh, gut wrenching, and it truly <laughs> is. It's it's difficult to watch. Uh, and it's not so much the gore. I mean, that was this movie's very gory for yeah, a film this... made in this time period for Japan. However, it, it's not so much the gore that gets me. It's the goddamn sound effects that they add in. Because it's yeah. all him, like, gagging and gurgling and... Wishing sounds. You hear the you, you, I, the, the shaking of the bamboo stick itself. Oh. <laughs> First time I watched it, I gagged. Uh, it was on before they took before Netflix was stupid and took down all the Mizaki Kobayashi films. Uh, yes, they had a bunch of them up there for a while, and that's how I saw them. Uh, hmm. I gagged when I watched that scene. I was like, "Oh, huh. <laughs> um, it is very difficult to sit through." Um, and then you which, watch him bite off his own tongue. Which, if anyone is wondering why he's doing this with a bamboo stick. Uh, that's a plot thing. He had to sell his real swords because of his poverty. Yeah, and, and to give um, Matomo some credit, he doesn't steal Tetsuya Nakadai's sword. No. He does because he could have easily taken Tetsuya Nakadai, and I believe Tetsuya Nakadai... No, I, actually, Tetsuya Nakadai wouldn't have given it to him, because there's that scene w after they bring the body back, he grabs his own sword and then slams it down on the, on the counter several times and says, it's all because I had to hold on to this. Yeah, that, that's the moment that he um, realizes the folly of the Bushido Code. That's the minute that he turns against the Bushido Code. It's really the moment, watching the film, that you realize that, oh, this movie is a, a stance against the Bushido Code. Um, yeah, that's kind of the aha moment of the film. It's when you realize what what the film is actually about. Well, like Pla subject. Planet of the Apes was the trial scene. This scene was the was the was the part where he takes the sword and slams it down on yeah. the counter. Yeah. So uh, Matomo had to sell his actual swords because he was uh, out of money, essentially. Out of money, he was in poverty. They had sold off everything else, and he sold it. Which again, under the Bushido Code, big no no. He shows up at the uh, place asking to perform harakiri with no intentions of actually doing it. Um, and also carrying these bamboo swords, so naturally this only adds fuel to the fire when the uh, clans members discover this, because they, which is really weird to say clans members and not think of the KKK, right. but uh, he, when they discover this, this only adds fuel to their fire of thinking that he's a coward who is trying to scam them out of money. Uh, which he isn't, he isn't at all. Uh, Matomo, in fact, is the most morally stable character in the movie, in my opinion. 
uh, because yeah. he's genuinely doing everything for his family. Uh, I mean, Tetsuya Nakadai is uh, as well, but not to the extent of, of Motomo, because Tetsuya Nakadai is still holding on to his honor, essentially. He, he is the most tragic figure of the film. Uh, even when we go back into his backstory, his his true father, the father that um, uh, conceived him, uh, was also a victim of this uh, uh, this system in which people are to kill themselves if they've been dishonored. Or in, in his case, he hadn't even been dishonored. He killed himself because his uh, master was going to, and he wanted to escort. To he wanted him to escort afterlife. him. Yeah, he made sure to to without without Tetsuya Nakadai's knowledge. He didn't, and those two were best friends. He did it without even Tetsuya Nakadai's knowledge, knowing that Tetsuya Nakadai would follow him. Exactly. Right, and that's what kind of character Tetsuya Nakadai is in this film. And so the head of the dying clan here actually has to order Tetsuya Nakadai not to kill himself. And because of the code, he's obliged not to. Um, right, which he might have wound up happier if he had. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know how everything else would have worked out, but... <laughs> <laughs> his, his daughter would have, you know, eventually died of tuberculosis anyway, so I don't guess, I don't guess it would make a difference. I don't know. Um, <laughs> he, uh... Yeah, so that only makes the, the, the puku scene in this film even worse, knowing that, you know, disemboweling yourself with a piece of metal is one thing. It's another thing entirely with bamboo. He he has difficulty and has to try several times just to get that. Just to get stab. it, and, and a nice bit of detail on the production crew whose value is that you see a little bit of blood on the tip his first try, then you see a little more, then you see a little more, and then you see it spill out. Yeah, he finally managed yeah, to ram that and thing. And it looks like it hurts. Like, you know, it, you, you see somebody, like, kill themselves on camera now, or on screen now, it's almost like a whatever... Here, it, not only does the camera like to linger, first off, beautiful cinematography on the scene too with all the Dutch angles and the weird camera movements and push-ins and pull-outs. Um, extremely well executed. Uh, I love those low angles. And the and it's intercut with all the people watching because because it, it was very ritual for the entire clan to like watch well, this they happen. Made a point. They made a point of making sure that it was um, to humiliate for, in this case. They made it sure that it was required for all of their samurai to come and view this uh, um, ceremony. And in this case, it was to humiliate Matomo. It was uh, Matome. That yeah, was, they do it under the purpose. The, yeah, they do it under the pretense of saying, "Hey, there's been a lot of people faking Harakiri later, lately. Come look at this guy who's actually going to do it. Isn't he a great example for all of us and of the Bushido code?" But in reality, it's it's like you're saying it's humiliation it's right and to make to make bad what matters worse for Matomo he bites his tongue yeah which is a no no when committing harakiri <laughs> because Matomo Matome, Matome is begging for that guy who is going to chop his head off to kill him to end it but he keeps saying no because he needs to pull the blade across and it's like you're pulling a bamboo oh <laughs> A, yeah. trying to pull a bamboo like it makes me it makes me <laughs> it makes me gag just thinking about it like you saw this bamboo sword it's shaking in his hands you see you see the handle flapping around and everything because bamboo isn't that tough you see the blood running down the bamboo it's uh and you know when you see seppuku happen in other movies it's very clean because they're using real swords it's very clean it goes right through them they don't usually go into the detail about the whole dragging across thing. They just sort of stab themselves and then fall over. But it's it's very clean. A little bit of blood spills out and everything. This is brutal and gritty and more realistic. Uh -huh. This... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. And you can tell that the clan hates Matome because they could have easily given him another pair of sword. Or another oh, yeah. another pair of, of Harakiri weapons because there are specific weapons you know that second blade that they always carry with them yeah that's specifically for harakiri yeah. i love how they have to have their own separate blade right that's that fucked like up if, ladies and gentlemen that that, that's fucked that's really fucked that's fucked up don't do it don't don't don't, don't commit seppuku at home ladies and gentlemen <laughs> 
<laughs> that would be like if you gave your soldiers like an extra handgun just in case they got captured by enemies and had to take themselves out. Like, don't use your other one. You know, <laughs> we know it would have the same effect, but but this is this is the one you use for that. This is your suicide gun. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, usually they have pills for that, Dylan. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> um, True. It's, it's a lot easier to go up than fucking slicing your belly open. And you know what, me? You know what made me <laughs> the Criterion Collection box cover for Harakiri is just like what looks like an open slit. Yeah, it's you know? still <laughs> that that same image is also the uh, the image on IMDb. Uh, I'm like, oh great. <laughs> and it just says Harakiri. <laughs> oh, uh, uh. <laughs> but, but it's really this. And at the time, when you're watching this, you feel bad for him, but in a different way because you don't know his backstory. You feel bad for him because he's like, oh god, he has to do that with a bamboo fucking stick. Like he really got fucked over in this in this scam of his. But then you find out it isn't even a scam. You're like, oh god. Yeah, you're like, oh god. And it wasn't really an oh god moment for me. It was like, oh. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> oh god. Oh no. Oh, I mean, technically, I guess it was a scam. But it was a it was a justifiable scam. It was <laughs> a justifiable scam. He was being a good used car salesman. Right. He, he had no choice in the matter. Right. Um. <sighs> God, and you know, they make a point of telling us that this is a thing that's been happening a lot lately and that a lot of the other clans, when somebody does this, they'll just give, give them the money, money. Just, to, yeah. just that they can get them out of their hair. Boy, did he pick the wrong house to go to. I mean, how many how many lords' houses had to be in the surrounding area that he could have picked? But no, he goes to the one that's like, no, we'll, we'll make you do it. Ugh. Ugh. Really bad luck on, on his... Uh, Nothing <laughs> good happens to any of the characters in this film. None no. of them. Now, at the beginning, you kind of get a glimpse of something good happening. Like, I love the scenes with Tetsuya Nakadai acting with um, that their ba the baby there. Uh, I yeah. love those scenes because it looks like Tetsuya Nakadai is genuinely happy. It looks like the family's genuinely happy. Snap with the snap of the fingers. Next scene, the rug gets. <laughs> thrown out from under him. Starts spitting up blood. Yeah, and oh, oh god, oh Jesus, and she got it all over that nice that nice piece of white paper. I mean, come on here. Um, <laughs> even even the paper suffers in this movie. I know, uh, I know. <laughs> when something good does happen to a character, it, it dies. Uh, now, you wouldn't notice the film, but it is interesting to note that almost like 95% of this film takes place indoors. That's yeah, true. That's like, true, like there's it? hardly any establishing shots whatsoever. The only two examples I can think of... Well, I mean, technically the, the courtyard is sort of an open space, but okay. it's still inside... Yeah, you're right. it's, it's still inside of their, like, compound. Which I don't, don't know if you noticed it either, but they even changed the lighting in there as the movie went on to make it look like the day was going by. Oh, wow, that's... Yeah, that's yeah, those, yeah, the entire film was filmed on a set other than the two or the three sequences where he goes after those those three guys. Um, those and the scene when we first flash back to him and the other guy and they're, like, practicing their archery. Right. Those, those are the only examples I can think of being, like, outside and not, like, inside, like, the compound or in, just indoors in general. Right, um, right. Um... Which can be hard for some audiences because it it does make it personally several scenes. This isn't just as new viewing. A few times before that, it left me going, "My God, I can't breathe," <laughs> and I can't tell if that was intentional or not. Uh, so I can't really say that that is necessarily a complaint because I don't know if 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 that's what Mizaki Kobayashi was trying to do. There is almost no production notes on this movie whatsoever, by the way. It could be designed to increase the, the tension in the viewer. Um, it could. Because having a tense viewer will only make the, the sort of centerpiece of the movie, which is that lovely disemboweling that we were discussing, uh, having a viewer who's already a little bit tensed up would only make that scene more effective, I, I would think. Um, uh, that happens fairly early on in the movie, too, doesn't it? It does, it does. Yeah. That's maybe... What did you say, like, a quarter of the way in? Yeah, yeah, uh, the movie is, is like, two hours and 15 minutes long, somewhere around there. 
And that's another complaint that I have. I felt like a couple of scenes just went on way too long and lingered. Mm -hmm. I, I, this movie definitely moves at a very, very, very slow pace. It does. Uh, and, and a lot of Mizaki Kobayashi films do that. They take their sweet-ass time. But here, it, it bugged me because some of the shots just lingered. and it, it does until the end where shit hits the fan. Yeah, when shit hits uh, the fan at the ending, you're like, oh, God, yes. Um, it's like the climax. Yeah. Um, and Very sort of drawn-out climax involving a, a realization of what's been going on and then a... A, a, reali a sudden realization of great truth. Indeed. And then Tetsuya Nakadai getting fucked up really bad. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, which they don't just like... God damn, he gets all sorts of fucked up in this movie, in that fight scene. Like, he gets cuts. He gets shot. Uh, then he gets sliced. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about as bad as that, that priestess woman from Daimajin. Oh, uh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Only less comedic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, what a way to tie this, this thing up. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, like like the scene in Daimajin, only less comedic. Um, Even though that scene wasn't intentionally comedic. <laughs> no, it's, it's only funny because of how many times she gets up. <laughs> and you're like, just die just already. Just die already. <laughs> All right, like, so even Dylan, if you're not dead yet, just do yourself a favor and play dead, please. Play dead, please. Pull up awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll die in a few minutes, I promise. Oh, God. So, Dylan, i got to ask, what are your final thoughts on Mizaki Kobayashi's Harakiri? I was supremely impressed with this film. Um, obviously, I don't have any other Kobayashi films to compare it to, as you do. Um, but I found it visually striking. Uh, I found the, the score uh, to fit it perfectly and create the right atmosphere and tone in the scenes where it's used. <laughs> right. Um, I thought that the acting, especially from Nakadai and that the guy who runs the house. What, oh, Saito? Name Saito. Especially from yeah, them. Yeah, he's a masterful actor. You'll see him, the, the guy who played Saito, you'll see him in uh, in the first segment of Quiet Anne. Mm. Those two and Matome, especially from those three, I felt like the acting, the acting in this was uh, superb. Uh, just on every level, this was just quality, quality filmmaking. And so... Uh, provocative and, and brutal, uh, unlike anything that you see uh, in other sort of, you know, my background in Japanese cinema is pretty much, you know, kaiju stuff, and now a few <laughs> Kurosawa films. Vastly different than that. Um, this is like as far away from kaiju as you could possibly get, Dylan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I have seen Love Battle Royale, so it's probably a little bit closer to that, but that's still stylized. Um... So different from any of that stuff, and so I was just I was I was blown away and captivated by it personally. Um, and while I certainly see why the ending could be a bummer, uh, I thought that um in terms of the story and the way it was set up and the way it was going, I, I think it ended pretty much in the way that it needed to, or in the way that it just would if that that story was happening in real life. Um. It, it, he very unapologetically says, there is no happy ending to this. This is a fucked up scenario. <laughs> and that's just all there is to it. And um, I admire that. Uh, I, I do too, from a certain standpoint. I mean, I, I think this movie, as Dylan said, is, is beautifully shot, uh, well acted, uh, well directed, well lit. If there's anything that Akira, that Akira Kurosawa, anything that Mizaki Kobayashi does extremely well is his lighting be it realistic or not, you can't help but be captivated by it. Um, I think the script overall was really well. I think the film lingered a little bit too much. I think you could have easily cut out about 15 minutes of the film and still had the same points get across. Uh, but other than that, an absolutely masterful film. Uh, I highly, I recommend it to the highest degree. Absolutely highest okay. degree. If you're a cinephile like I am, this is a must-see. <laughs> If you've ever enjoyed the samurai genre, even in like the slightest respect, even if you're someone who has only ever watched friggin' Samurai Jack. <laughs> oh god. Samurai Jack? <laughs> <laughs> samurai Jack. If, if you're in any way 
interested in, in the samurai genre or, or historically just have an interest in feudal Japan, um, this is a must see. Uh, right. It, it's it's the only film that I've seen or that I can think of that offers this stance on the Bushido Code, that offers a criticism of the Bushido Code. You always see it glorified. Yeah, yeah. The whole honor system, even in Western movies that have like an Eastern theme, like, uh, I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> is the first example that pops into mind, but others as well. They always glorify this sort of Eastern sort of honor system. And this is the first time and only time that I've seen that you see somebody say, well, that's all well and good, but here's the, the dark side to that. Here's the, the fucked up thing about that. Here's where that system is pushed too far. Right. It's all part of the same coin, but it's just a different side. Um, that that's essentially what this is. And so, Dylan, if you like this, you will love Samurai Rebellion. Then. <laughs> that's what Sean Barry keeps telling me. <laughs> um. But yeah, what what would you? You don't rate films, right? Well, I, I do sometimes. Um, if I'm in a review with somebody who does. <laughs> um, like me. Usually, <laughs> and I usually go out of five. So I don't have, then what would I don't you have, give this? I don't have any I don't really have any complaints. Uh so I'm gonna give it a five. Uh Dylan McCandless here gives this film a five. What are you retarded? No. Uh gives this <laughs> film a, a five out of five. I give this movie a three and a half out of four stars. I do, yes, I'm old school and go with Roger Ebert. I rate out of four. Um hmm. I give this movie a very strong three and a half out of four stars. Other than the lingering for a little bit, there's nothing else really wrong with the film. So, uh, yeah. So, Dylan, uh, you still gonna go kill yourself? No, I'm good. You're good? Uh, You're good? Yeah, I need to have this, uh, good talk here. Good talk. Yeah, you know. Okay. Not too thrilled about the whole bamboo uh, embowelment thing, uh, disembowelment. Uh, yeah, so. I had the bamboo sticks ready. I just had a feeling you were going to come to my house and ask for suicide by bamboo right. stick. Which is an odd premonition to have. Right, right. It just it just came to me in a dream one day. Considering that we live several states apart. Yeah, uh, yeah. Weird. And there are much more convenient places for me to choose uh, for seppuku. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think this out very much, did I? <laughs> Well, if I could travel all the way to uh, Nebraska to burn down Patrick Galvin's house, I think you can travel all the way here to commit spooku. <laughs> all right, so this is the end of this review, everybody. Uh, I was joined by my good friend Dylan McCandless here. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Awesome. It's short, sweet, to the point. And this is Adam Noise Civilian Productions saying, sign off. <laughs>